I said, if it's possible, would you let me know, am I under investigation? He said, you are not under investigation. You can ask the FBI director if you're under investigation. I can ask the FBI director if I'm under investigation. But can you ask the FBI director if you're under investigation, if you're the president of the United States and you have the power to fire the FBI director? Isn't it inappropriate for the president of the United States to ask the FBI director directly if he is under investigation? No, I don't believe it is. But one of these conversations the president said happened at a dinner where the FBI director, according to the president, was asking to stay on as FBI director. Don't you see how that's a conflict of interest? The FBI director is saying he wants to keep his job, and the president is, is asking whether or not he is under investigation. I, I don't see that as a conflict of interest, and neither do the many uh, legal scholars and others that have been commenting on it for the last hour. So, no, I don't see that as an issue. Joining us now. Joining us now, Lawrence Tribe, Harvard Law Professor. Uh, professor Tribe, uh, so I can ask the FBI director if I'm under investigation, but if I have the power to fire the FBI director, I'm president of the United States, what are the implications of me then asking the FBI director if I'm under investigation? Well, it's much worse than just a conflict of interest. You're essentially dangling in front of the person who's supposed to be investigating the chaos swirling around you and perhaps you, you're basically saying, if you will assure me that I'm not going to be under investigation, then maybe I'll keep you on. We'll see what happens. I mean, he, it's, the, it, it's essentially the language of bribery. It's the, it's the language of, of the underworld, of racketeering, not the language of a president who is supposed to be uh, enforcing the rule of law. It's, it's staggering. I mean, for all of the bizarre things that have happened in these 112 or 113 days, this is really like the 13th chime of a clock. It makes the whole thing come apart. Well, and this is what the president is claiming uh, today in his c conversation with Lester Holt. We don't mm -hmm. know if it's true because, of course, it was Donald Trump talking. But James Comey now has let it be known to the New York Times through associates that, yes, there was a dinner. Uh, James Comey says that the president invited him to that dinner and he felt that he couldn't refuse a meeting with the president. And at that dinner, he was asked by the president to pledge his personal loyalty to the president. Your, your reaction to it's that, Professor? My reaction is it's staggering. I mean, if that is clearly, on its face, obstruction of justice. And it is characteristic of the way we know Donald Trump talks and the way he's behaved. He only wants loyalists, yes men, and perhaps some yes women around him. And in this case, what loyalty clearly means, and I think the statements that Director Comey has made to close associates validate this view. What it really means is, can I count on you not to make me a target of this investigation? That's clearly an impermissible question. It, so either Trump's own account of the discussion is true, in which case he's guilty of obstruction of justice in one respect, or much more likely, Comey's account is true, in which Comey gave him no assurances, said, you can count on me to be honest, but not to be reliable and not to swear fealty to you. My loyalty is to the law and to the Constitution, in which case, again, Trump is guilty of attempting to suborn obstruction of justice. Either way, as with the first article of impeachment against Richard Nixon, this is a series of high crimes and misdemeanors all by itself, regardless of whether Trump was or was not part of a collusive plot with Russia to steal an American election. I mean, some people have not drawn a clear enough distinction. There are two kinds of impeachable offenses here. One we don't know enough about yet to charge, and that is, what is the truth of all of the complicated interactions with Manafort and Stone and and uh, and Flynn and and the the whole the whole uh, catastrophe um, with Russia. That's the underlying conduct. But whatever the underlying conduct, sometimes the cover up is at least as bad. And in this case, the cover up is now 
completely on its face. I mean, the, by changing the story as he did, by in effect hanging all of his staff and all of his assistants and the vice president out to dry and suddenly coming up with a new truth, the president has made clear that he is trying to cover up the cover up. And I think that we are now in a situation where the only way to avoid constitutional crisis uh, is for members of Congress to basically get a spine or grow a pair and really stand up to their responsibilities to the law. So we need an independent counsel, mm -hmm. but we also need an independent active Congress. Professor, you've joined a, a group called the Shadow Cabinet, which is a, a group of 18 policy mm -hmm. experts that will follow statements and positions made by the president and his cabinet right. and de debunk and interpret as needed. Uh, you'll be in the role there as the citizen attorney general in that Shadow Cabinet. I assume you will be focusing mostly on this Russia investigation, but you're also been focusing very heavily on emoluments. Uh, do those two things intersect? They certainly do. I mean, when the president basically went out of his way to say that, you know, I don't uh, have any investments in Russia, as Ron Klain rightly said, Russia may have investments in him. The emoluments problem is a problem of divided loyalty. And we have a lawsuit pending against the president saying that he has so many foreign entanglements that he's in constant violation of the Constitution because. Basically, he is in a position of getting benefits from foreign governments, including perhaps loans, and owing things to foreign governments in violation of a basic principle that the framers put in place to avoid having our president corrupted by foreign powers. And if we had an attorney general that we could trust, uh, then there would be direct investigation by the Justice the Justice Department into the president's violation of the emoluments clauses. Instead, we have to sue him, and I think we're going to succeed in getting a judicial decree. So uh, stay tuned. Professor Lawrence Tribe, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's always an honor to have you. Really appreciate it. It's great to be on. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.